Hello veterans, this is Dennis Young again on day five of the VFW 123rd National Convention. Uh, I am with the Veterans Memorial Park and Digital Library and we have a Daniel... Danny. Danny Sampler? Sample. Sample. See, I'm <laughs> terrible at that. Who, who stopped by and wanted to do an interview with us because he wanted to uh, save his story out there. And it's a great thing. Sir, can you spell your last name for us? S-A-M-P-L-E. All right, thanks, sir. So we're going to go back a little bit in time. Kind of start back like where you grew up. Okay. What you did, where you went to school, uh, when you graduated, your parents, your family, and then, like, what got you going to go into the military? So uh, I grew up in a military family. Um, I'm born and raised in the great state of Mississippi. Uh, and so my father... Uh, is a retired colonel out of the Mississippi uh, Army Guard, so I kind of grew up in and around the military. Um, always had relatives that had served in the military all the way back to the Revolutionary War uh, that we can document uh, from all the way up from Mississippi, North Alabama, uh, into Pennsylvania. But I, uh, growing up around the military, I enlisted in the Mississippi Army Guard in 1985. And uh, after graduating high school in Columbus, Mississippi, and went to Mississippi State University, and then I was able to contract into the ROTC and was commissioned a second lieutenant in 1987. And I retired in June of 2021 as an 06 after 36 years of service in the Guard on some deployments and through the Army Reserve. So uh, it's been a long, very, very, uh, very enjoyable and humbling career. Um, I've served everywhere from, I've served in across the state of Mississippi in the Mississippi Guard, but uh, training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, National Training Center in California, uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, I've been to Korea four times, uh, served in Iraq, I served in Baghdad and OIF-2 with 1st Cavalry Division. Um, and then uh, when I got back from Iraq, I served as the Deputy Director of Military Support during Hurricane Katrina down on the Gulf Coast. So um, from about 2003 until about November 2005, I was deployed uh, somewhere, whether I was deployed to Fort Hood, Iraq, or for Hurricane Katrina. Um, and then I spent my last three years on active duty from 2007 to 2010 in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, as a deputy commander of a training brigade and then went on to take battalion command of a drill sergeant battalion in Kentucky. Uh, took a detachment command at Fort Benning, Georgia as a 06 colonel and chief of staff of the 100th training division at Fort Knox, Kentucky. And then ended my career um, working for the command drill staff college out of Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. I was able to get my master's degree in strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College. Uh, in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, and uh, so that uh, you know, 20 years in in the armored force in an armored brigade or battalion, and then the last few years of my career was in in training training soldiers and uh, to prepare them and their staffs for uh, any potential deployment that we may go. Wow, interesting career. <laughs> what year did you graduate high school? 1984. Okay, same time we did. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so it's, it seems like uh, it, the distance just doesn't seem possible to, from where we are now to back to 1984. Um, and I have, uh, my wife and I have three boys, um, 30, 26, and 20. And wow, any of the military? So our middle son is in a, he is a lieutenant in an infantry unit in the Alabama National, Army National Guard. Um, he's a platoon leader. Our youngest son is a junior at the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina. So wow. he is in, uh, on an Army ROTC scholarship there. He is a cadet platoon sergeant. Um, so he, he is, uh, we just got him off uh, the day we left coming here. We put him on the road back to Charleston. So um, he's getting ready for, he's a cadet cadre. So they got the new, what they call knobs. The new freshman will be coming in in about a week. So. He's going to be training them, getting them ready for their adventure at Citadel. How oh, very interesting. Very interesting. So, is this your first 
Okay. This convention. is my second convention, okay. national convention. I just haven't had a chance to go. I've been, um, my post stood up three and a half years ago, almost four years ago. Um, we've been all American in the two years that I was in command there. I am now the senior vice for the state of Alabama. And um, being able to, to continue to serve and to work with other veterans has been a very humbling. It's also for my wife and I to kind of work together to serve veterans a little bit more because... Is she in the auxiliary? She's in the auxiliary. She's the treasurer of the auxiliary. And the, um, the thing is that most of my career was in combat arms. So I was always in the field or I was always deployed. So most of the time her involvement with me was at military balls or just meet and greet and, and so now that I'm retired I'm involved with the VFW we're running our own business together we've uh, we're able to do things like this come to a national convention go to the state conventions she's involved I'm involved and it's something that we do together since we became empty nesters you know, a couple of years ago and and so it's like wow it's just us again so uh, this really gives us a chance and she's able to talk to other spouses that um, are kind of going through the same thing that are more involved with their their spouses that are that were serving that are no longer serving but they everyone can kind of serve together to support one another and to help with a lot of causes for veterans that do need a little pick-me-up little help um, and my wife enjoys being able to talk with other veteran spouses and kind of talk about their experiences with with us deployed and, and um, it's a different outreach and they kind of share stories and just like we we veterans within the post share a lot of stories you know the even though we get out of uniform there's still a lot of things that we have to talk about and just through our our post is a small post and but yet uh, there's always somebody there to talk to you and if you need somebody to talk it's always a text away and we can meet together and have a cup of coffee or go have a drink somewhere. So it's uh, it's always good to continue to, the camaraderie is something that you build over years, decades. And Definitely, uh, definitely. So it, it, it helps. It really that's, does. That's outstanding. So um, you said uh, your, wife and I, your wife and you have your own business? Yes. So, uh, so we started a small brewery. Uh, about oh. uh, yeah, about four years ago. So we were open one year before the pandemic hit, and so now we're uh, we're starting to pick things back up. But we have a little small five barrel brewery in Alabaster, Alabama. Um, we make uh, beer, wine, and ciders. And, cool. Uh, it's actually the home of the post. So our post home is in the brewery, and uh, so it's kind of nice on the days we're not open or the mornings we're not open is when we have our post meeting. And then afterwards, we kind of open the taps, and it's kind of a place for a lot of veterans, uh, especially um, within the post, come hang out during the week, and, and they're able to in, enjoy the community, and the community is able to enjoy talking with other veterans. Outstanding. Now, you said uh, you're senior vice. Yes. So next year, you're going to be the commander. Be Are commander. you going to go to Phoenix? Going to Phoenix, absolutely. That will be there, too. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll catch up again. Absolutely. Next year. Now, next year, I don't know if we'll have our digital library with us, but we'll maybe have a booth yeah. that uh, we'll have maybe some way that we can do interviews and maybe like to catch up with you. Absolutely. What kind of plans are you having when you become state commander next year? So, my wife is already pinging me. I think that's her pinging me now on my phone, but uh, she has some ideas that she wants to do with some various projects across the state. Um, for me, I think a lot of what we're going to try to do is work towards mental health with veterans. Um, it, that's uh, really kind of a, a close one to me. And so we want to try to assist our state with uh, getting better uh, mental health care for our veterans um, and to really educate a lot of our veterans about what the VFW can do for them. Um, I think a lot of veterans out there, they know they get out, but they don't know when they get out what they've got available to them. So having a VFW post around the state that has the ability to know where veterans are coming into their town or whether uh, closer to post or air bases where veterans are getting out, how we can get uh, the information about how the VFW can help you once you come out of uniform. Um, that's kind of a big thing for, for us. Um, we're already talking about what we want to 
do in Phoenix and, and to try to help promote the state of Alabama and some of the things that we do across Alabama and some of our industry. Um, I think a lot of what we're trying to do through my post and we're going to try to continue a lot with uh, with the state as I take command is that uh, we're wanting to try to get more information into the high schools about the voice of democracy and the Patriots pen. Getting more of our youth involved in understanding the sacrifices that uh, men and women make each and every day, whether it's in law enforcement or whether it's in the armed services. So I, I think a lot of educating our younger our younger generation is, is going to be more and more important for us as veterans now. Oh, that is outstanding. And I'm going to ask you one other important question that you probably know what I'm going to ask you. You're going to be the state commander. Mm -hmm. Recruitment. Absolutely. What kind of plan do you kind of envision right now? And I know plans change, but <laughs> what kind of things are you envisioning when you take state commander so next one of year? My, uh, one of my benefits is having the state membership chairman is in my post, and he just took over command of the post as I just left the post. So he and I have been talking this week about sitting down and actually working and putting forth a recruitment plan. A lot of times as we see uh, the recruiting of veterans, we have to make the VFW a reason for them to want to be a part of the organization. Too many times we have that stigmatism of it's just a dark place, people sitting around playing cards and smoking. And not that any of that is good, not that any of that is bad, but how you try to encourage the Desert Storm OEF, OEF veterans to get more involved into the VFW. Some of that is the encouragement of when you hold your post meetings and where you hold your post meetings. Does a post meeting have to be at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday when most of the younger veterans are still working, they haven't fully retired? Uh, is it to getting out into locations that you know these younger veterans are? Does it mean setting up uh, membership booths during the summertime out at a ballpark or um, at, at your local park and just setting up a booth? Is it to where posts need to look into having areas for these younger veterans to bring their children? And so that the, those children can come to the post meetings, they can have a separate room. That's what we do is we have a separate room for the veterans that bring their young children. They're able to go in there and they have some toys or games and things to do while we have our post meeting. Is it, uh, again, getting more involved at the local school level because a lot of the younger veterans have school age children so how you can with the voice of democracy patriots pen you're able to get in and they can kind of see for us it has been the fact that a lot of the younger generations are more of a digital age generation um, yep, so they're what my organization is about so they're more apt to be able to share on a facebook group as opposed to wanting to go and sit down in a brick and mortar location that's why we're not a brick and mortar post our post is just in a local brewery that they can always come to at any given time and bring their kids. They can go out back. We can have events uh, at the brewery. I think a lot of um, some of the membership drives that we're going to look towards is everybody goes to Home Depot and Lowe's and sets up those things, but are you going to, like I said before, those ballparks? Are you going to setting up maybe at a grocery store as opposed to a, um, a Lowe's? Because we also have to ensure that we have more women veterans that are eligible for the VFW now than pretty much any time we've had in the past. So how do we encourage that? A lot of that's going to be setting up women veterans initiatives. How can we reach out to those women veterans? So one of my objectives when I take command of the State Department is to establish a women's veterans committee so that I can have a woman veteran committee that, that can address women veterans issues and how can we address more women veterans and get more women veterans involved uh, within the VFW. Oh and definitely you know because <clears throat> excuse me you know the military has like a 70 percent uh, which is kind of small uh, women in the military and we're not even anywhere close to that. Exactly. Now we have a million plus veterans out there from Desert Storm, Desert Shield through IF that are out there right now mm -hmm. And that's untapped resources for the VFW, and Absolutely. I, you know, I love your plan. I'm, matter of fact, not only going to put your your interview <laughs> on our site and all that, but I'm also going to put your interview on the Ohio Department's page, just so people can hear what you yeah. got to say. Because I think what you said right now was very right on, mm 
mm -hmm. and very important. One of our initiatives also in the post that I'm going to carry over into the state is we're going to start a podcast. And so we know that the VFW has a national podcast. However, getting a podcast more at the local level and trying to get that out there, whether it's with the QR code like your cards or um, just getting some hashtags. Because our post has an Instagram page as well as a Facebook page. So it, it, we're going to try to continue that more at the state level to encourage the Instagrams. But I think a podcast, and we kind of talk the, the, call it an at ease hour, and where it's just an hour where we do address those kind of issues that are pertinent to a particular group of veterans. And we do. We are a particular group. So we have, you don't want to call them clicks, but you have your niche within the VFW. You have everything from the World War II, Korea, Vietnam the various desert storms, just cause, and then you have your post 9-11. And each of those groups of veterans have different issues. And so we can't go and address specifically vet, uh, Vietnam veteran issues, because you, you know, we need to, but we also need to be able to, the next week, talk about what issues are addressing OIF and OEF. How can we get the information about the PACT Act more at the local level, because we push it at the national, how do we get it more at the local level? So I think podcasts are going to be very important for us, too, great, over next year. Great thing. Great, great. Hi. Right, well, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure talking to you. You, too. Thank you.